look at this. This is fantastic. Everybody's already jumping in there saying good morning. Fantastic day. Everybody is excited to hear from our spotlight speaker today. And so um, before we get started, I just wanted to do a couple of announcements and just remind you about uh, checking out the uh, library for some of our past uh, videos. Johnny, I want to do a shout out for Johnny because Johnny has been uh, doing a great job at making those videos. So if you miss somebody, you can always go back to that uh, link on there and I'll post that for you in a little bit. And you can check out some of the past ones. Don't forget CES is coming up and just all kinds of stuff is happening on the Women and Drones website. So check it out. All right? Win free tickets. Enter the drawing. Win free tickets. Woohoo! <laughs> All right. Sometimes that's just what you need to make a decision, a free ticket. And then you're like, you know, I was on the edge. Then I want, it's called success leaves clues. You're like, okay, that's the sign I'm in. <laughs> that's it. Yes. <laughs> so, so good to see everybody here today. <laughs> and we'll go ahead and let in a last couple people here because we don't want anybody to miss out on hearing about Eric's adventure there in Iceland. So, got a couple more. And so, let's go ahead and segue over. Eric Hanscom is here to share, you know, he's been on here before, so we thank you for past appearances, but today he's going to share about his Iceland flights and just the whole adventure of him going over there. So welcome, Eric, and thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to make you spotlight. Okay, great. All right. Can everybody hear me? Can somebody give me a thumbs up here? We Excellent. hear you. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you for coming. Um, when Desi first approached me, the volcano in Iceland was erupting like crazy and it was really exciting. And uh, so I thought I'd be giving uh, kind of a how-to uh, presentation about where to where you want to park your car, where you want to rent your car, hotels to stay in, hiking trails to take and stuff like that. Unfortunately, for the last four weeks, the Iceland volcano has been pretty much dormant. And so I'm going to have to, I, I've kind of... Boy, is anybody else getting a major? Oh, hold on. Somebody needs to maybe mute themselves. We're getting a little bit of feedback. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting an echo, 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 echo. I think we're good. Okay. All right. I'm still getting an echo. I think I might have found it. Okay. So I think we're good. All right, great. So anyway, um, the Iceland volcano has not erupted in four weeks now, and a lot of people are expecting that this is going to be it. So I'm giving a presentation about the Iceland volcano, and I'm kind of segueing into some other considerations that you might want to take into consideration if you're going to be flying in really cold, nasty environments. So first of all, let me just tell you how I got into drones. I mean, everybody else who does these presentations, they've all got you know, all these certifications and stuff like that that are really cool. And they passed all these tests. I'm just kind of a guy with a drone. But uh, I was teaching a friend of mine from high school to fly a couple weekends ago. And he was asking me, you know, how'd you get into it? And I told him the story. He goes, that's pretty interesting. So anyway, I thought I'd tell the quick story. Um, about seven years ago, one of my clients, who's a, a very well respected kind of elder state, statesman in the surfing community, he calls me up and he's super excited. He says, you wouldn't believe it. There's some, there's some flying camera over the lineup at C Street. And he gave me a link and I looked at it. I thought, okay, that's pretty cool. Um, sounds like fun. And then I didn't think much of it. And um, then I started thinking a little bit more and I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay, everybody see my screen? Okay, all right, great. So anyway, um, so I get this call from Steve and I'm thinking this is pretty exciting. And uh, for those of you who've met me and my family, you know that my wife is from Thailand. We have a little place over there and we had a little house out in the desert and these had been basically financial black holes for a number of years. On a good year, we'd maybe break even. And I thought, you know, if I get one of these flying cameras, and take pictures, maybe I could improve upon our current method of advertising, which is put these cruddy little three-fold brochures out and hope for the best. Um, 
And so anyway, I got online, bought myself a Phantom 2 and took off to Thailand and took off to Borrego. And all of a sudden I was able to put stuff like this up and things really took off. And um, we ended up selling out our Borrego place for a couple of years in a row. And Ty West got so busy. My wife actually had to fly over there and run it. And a couple of months, she made more running her resort than I made as a patent attorney. So I'm thinking, yeah, this is this is what investments are supposed to do. I mean, I've been so used to investments losing money every year that I just kind of become assumed, uh, okay, how much are we going to lose in Borrego? How much are we going to lose in Thailand? Oh, we actually made money. This is really bizarre. Now, of course, COVID hit, so Ty West is shut down for a while. But um, while I was flying, I began to really enjoy taking the pictures and kind of seeing the, the, the evolution of drones. And so I started flying more and more and really enjoying myself and ended up CNN picked up one of my pictures and then um, uh, DJI took another one for their homepage for a while. And so I started thinking, this is really, really getting to be a lot of fun. And then one time I was over in Thailand at my father-in-law's, he's got a little ranch there. And he asked me to fly his roof and look for problems there because he was in his mid seventies. He didn't want to be climbing up ladders looking there. And so I flew my drone over and we were able to find a hole that the guys who'd put on the roof had left. And so he pointed out the drone footage, said, you fix this. And they fixed it. Well, my brother-in-law was the chief monk at a temple at the time. And he said, can you come to our temple? And I said, sure, no problem. So Thailand temples, they have very steep roofs. And what they do to inspect them is they get these, these rickety ladders made out of bamboo. And they're held together with like strips of inner tube and stuff like that. And they pick the youngest and lightest monks and they have to climb up and take a little notepad with them and write down uh, the missing tiles and junk like that. And so, you know, the, these guys, poor guys fall and they get hurt. So he said, can you take a look at our roofs? So we said, sure, no problem. So we went over, we flew his roofs. We found the various problems, uh, like <laughs> plants growing out the side. And this is some wire hanging out of the crematorium smokestack. And so anyway, then, then we improved our technology a little bit so actually started circling the problems and so anyway the the monks took this and they went to the thai government and they said can we have a grant to fix up our temple and the thai government you know said well you know why should we and they said well here here's some footage for you and by the way if you ever get a chance to hang out with monks it was great we hung out with the monks we let them fly the drones and everyone had a good time so anyway um they took they took the footage and they ended up with a three quarter of a million dollar grant, which in, I mean, the average salary in Thailand is 10 bucks a day. Actually, I think minimum wage just went up to 11 bucks a day. So that's like, you know, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos money. And, it, and everyone was shocked and they're just going, how'd you ever get this much money? And they said, well, it's it's this foreigner guy who's uh, you know the husband of the sister of the monk at uh, the Wat Samsua. And so anyway, some other temple starts saying, hey, I, can you guys come over here? So. Anyway, this was after they got the grant and they fixed up the roofs. And so word spread and pretty soon we got invited to other temples. And needless to say, we took them up on every offer. And so we got to fly a whole bunch of temples all over Thailand. And uh, you know, we'd share the footage with the monks. We'd make them little pictures at the end that they'd appreciate. And we'd get to hang out. They'd watch us fly and we'd let them fly. So. This is really a whole lot of fun. And then DJI came out with this, uh, this, this contest for drone videos on, it was called Drones for Good or Personal Stories or something like that. So we made a little cartoon and we entered it and the honorable mentions came out and I wasn't there. And then the semifinals came out and I wasn't there. I said, okay, well, I guess I'm not very good at this. So I'm just gonna give up. And then one of the partners in my firm calls and they said, you got a couple of huge boxes and I, I'm a patent attorney. So I get huge boxes all the time. My clients send me all sorts of stuff. Sometimes it's stuff I like, like surfboards or skateboards. Other times it's like lighting apparatus or things like that, that I can never use. But so I got back to the office, ripped it open. It's a bunch of stuff from DJI. And I didn't, okay, what's this stuff here for? So like an idiot, I called them up and I said, Hey, I just got a couple boxes here. And they passed me through to a bunch of people. And I finally get some guy who goes, oh, we sent out the winter stuff last week. Didn't you get yours? I go, oh, God. I said, so admit to this guy. I hadn't even checked the results. He goes, well, didn't you look to see how you did? I say, well, yeah, but I gave up after the 
honorable mentions. And so anyway, he goes, well, okay. And so anyway, I felt like industrial strength idiot. But any, anyway, all it got a free drone, got a free case out of it. So it was all ended up well. So then I ended up deciding that this is pretty fun. So why don't I become a drone speaker? So I started uh, speaking at drone conventions. I always wanted to talk about drones and intellectual property because I'm an intellectual property attorney. They all wanted to hear about drones in the Thailand temples. So um, mostly I talked about drones in the Thailand temples. Um, my big break came when the California State Bar was putting on a seminar on drones and they didn't have anyone who flew drones. So they said, hey, Eric, can you join the panel? I said, sure. Parrot donated a couple of drones. So after the State Bar Convention, I took all the lawyers out to the, it was a Palm Springs hotel. We took them out to a field and we all flew drones and they they were the worst flyers ever. They crashed, they completely destroyed two Parrot Bebops within about 45 minutes, but everyone had a good time. And I ended up with my biggest client out of it. So it's like, I'm not complaining either. So then I started traveling and basically anybody who is in a foreign country that seemed like a cool place to fly a drone, I'd go there and fly. So I was in Shenzhen, um, got over to Bristol, got over to London a few times, but it's basically no fly. Um, drone Berlin, I actually flew my drone and videotaped me giving my presentation, which was probably not a very good idea, but anyway, I did it. But the, the really seminal moment here in where I wanted to fly drones and how I got into Iceland came when, um, I, now for many years, my firm had been using a uh, legal support team called Immunus IP over in India. And they do essentially all of our patent illustrations, they do our prior art searches, our trademark searches. I, I couldn't survive without these guys. And so I mentioned to them, we had a bunch of projects going on. I said, you know, I'd like to come over. Let's, let's just sit down and go over some stuff. And so they said, well, why don't we set up a drone conference for you to speak to at? And I said, okay, sure. So I had no idea, but basically they, <laughs> these guys are just incredible. I show up and they meet me, put me up in a fancy hotel. I have meals like you wouldn't believe. Then we show up at this place, they make me an honorary professor of droning or something like that. And they give me all these awards and drape all these things over my shoulders. And I'm, I'm like, whoa, this is like, I, I mean, in the US, I, I go to these conferences and I say, would you like me as a speaker? And they say, how big of a booth do you wanna buy? And oh, by the way, if you wanna be a speaker, it costs extra. I go over to India and they're like, put these, these flower laser over my neck. And so I'm like, yeah, this is, this is really cool. And then after that, they took me on a tour of India, and last but not least, they rented uh, the, the air-conditioned suite in a boat. We went on a two-day boat trip up a river, and so I'm, I'm, I, I finished this trip, and I got back, and I, I talked to my personal assistant. I said, Dina, your main job right now is to find me anywhere that'll take me as a speaker, anywhere in the world where I haven't found yet. I don't care if it's three Boy Scouts in Somalia. I mean, just just get me traveling. And so um, she came back and I was supposed to fly to, I guess, London and Berlin or something like that. And she said, the, the cheapest flight is this thing called Wow Airlines. And so I say, well, okay. I looked it up. I, I don't like the color of the plane. That kind of concerns me. And the name concerns me, but they do have an ice and stopover. And I looked on Dronestagram and five minutes later, I said, book it get me at least a five-day Iceland stopover because I looked at the pictures on drone Instagram and I realized that this country is just spectacular. So that was my first experience in Iceland is uh, the five-day stopover on my way to, to Europe. And I hit the ground and I just fell in love with the place. I mean, it just, if you've never been there, you really should go. It's just fantastic. Just fantastic. And, um, I, I got all over and pretty soon I came back and went a couple more times. And, um, you know, with Iceland, it's a place where the rivers just pour out the side of mountains and the water is so clean, you can drink out of any river. And so you buy one water bottle when you get there and you just refill it out of the streams. It's the cleanest country I've ever been in. And the flying is just spectacular if you don't mind the environmental conditions sometimes. <laughs> and I'll get to those a little bit later on. So anyway, I, I went to Iceland. I went actually went to Iceland four more, three more times after this trip, and then COVID hit, 
And so I sat around, I looked at my pictures and felt sorry for myself. This is the, the area where the continents are separating. This area, unfortunately, is now a no drone zone, but the, the section on the left is the North American plate. The section on the right is the Eurasian plate. They're pulling apart at three centimeters a year. So you can actually see plate tectonics in action. This is Thingveller Lake. Thingveller is the home of the longest lasting parliament in Europe. It goes back to 900 AD. It's one of the many hot springs. Um, Iceland doesn't need to import coal because they run basically everything off hydropower and geothermal. And when you've been near some of these hot springs, you can, you can see why. Icelanders are remarkably long lived. You walk through an average graveyard, awful lot of people live in their 90s or over 100. It's really amazing. But anyway, how, what, what happened? So I heard the volcano erupted. And so I quickly went out and I got my COVID shots. Well, I tried to get my COVID shots. Kaiser wanted a month. I said, I don't have a month. Um, CVS said, well, we'll try to fit you in where we can. So I was getting up at two and three in the morning, trying to log on for the next day. I finally got my first shot at some free clinic in Oceanside. And they signed me up for my second shot a week later. Then I get this text message from them saying, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> we're out of business. Uh, you need to get your second shot somewhere else. So I was just, you know, I, I had the whole family work and I try to find me any place that'll give me the second Pfizer shot anytime, four in the morning, I don't care, I'll go. And so um, I finally found a place, I, I think I think it was some pharmacy in like a part of Northern North County, San Diego that I would never go to at night. I probably shouldn't have gone to in the day, but I was like just barging in there. Sure, give me the shot, I don't care. Gang members move out of the way. I'm, I'm here to go to Iceland. So you guys don't want to mess with me right now. So I got my second shot. Then I needed to get a COVID shot. And the date had to be, or the, the date had to be less than 72 hours before uh, my plane left for Iceland. So I got the second COVID shot, the, the COVID test. And it's not very pleasant for those of you who had to go through it, but it was well worth it. And I nervously awaited the results of that because I had to get it close enough to the plane flight so that it didn't come in. Um, more than 72 hours before, but I had to get it, you know, not so close that it came in after I was supposed to board the plane. So it arrived that morning, that afternoon I boarded the plane, went to Iceland. Um, then once you get to Iceland, at that point, you had to get a second COVID test in Iceland. So you got both the nose and you got the throat. And there are a whole bunch of us at that point, the technology wasn't very good. So there are a whole bunch of us like bent over, blowing our noses with really high pitched voices because we'd all just been through this test and it was, uh, it was like going through boot camp or something like that. Anyway, after you get the test, you're supposed to self quarantine for four hours until the Icelandic uh, version of the CDC sends you the, um, the negative COVID test. So self quarantining, well, I'd been to Iceland before, so I knew where to self quarantine. Um, here's the volcano in the background. Notice one car, I am self quarantining. I went to Brim Kettle, only car in the parking lot self-quarantining again at the hot springs, one car, self-quarantining. Hoffed Blau, again, by myself. Rick Johnny's uh, Lighthouse, by myself. The Bike Path by Grindavik, by myself. Bridge Over the Continents, again, there's a little, you, can, you may be able to see it, there's a little blue car there, I am self-quarantining. So I was following protocol. And this is another place, there's actually a bridge between the North American plate, which is on the left, and the Eurasian plate, which is on the right. So then finally, I got, I got my okay from um, the Icelandic authorities, and they said, you're, you're clear to go. So I walked up to the volcano, and it was just, it was just amazing. Um, before this, the most incredible drone trip I've ever taken was the Svalbard where we got to go on icebergs and stuff like that, but this just knocked that out of the park. <coughs> so I flew all day and all night until the batteries were gone. Then I went back to the hotel, charged up, went back the next day. So five days in a row, I just spent my entire day at the volcano. And uh, as I was telling Desi beforehand, <laughs> I just wish I'd stayed a couple more days 
or had gone back more frequently because it was just it was just an incredible experience. It was so cold, but you're right there next to the volcanoes. So when the volcano erupted, it would actually warm you up. Now, please pay particular attention to this slide here. You'll notice the yellow stuff is molten lava flowing under what's a crust of dried, hardened lava. This, this will come into play later on. So anyway, um, as I said, the, the night was the most spectacular time to fly. So I cleared out a nice landing pad for myself and managed to bring the drone down most of the time, lost a few propellers on the rocks, but most of the time brought it back safely, did a lot of air grabs. So I brought along a, I, I brought along a ski glove um, for my right hand so I could grab it with that. Didn't have to worry about cutting my fingers. But there are all sorts of different areas that I was able to fly. You could go to the actual volcano. You could go where the lava was flowing down. You could go to the end of things. You could fly over the places where the lava was breaking out of its various barriers. And uh, a lot of people really enjoyed it. So it was kind of a it was kind of a neat thing. I, was, I ran into dronists from all over the world. And basically, if you had a drone, we were friends. And so I hung out with people from South Korea, from Israel, from India, from Russia. Ukraine, we just met all sorts of people there, Mexico. And um, what was there today could be gone tomorrow. So this this area, I shot this on, I think it was a Wednesday and Thursday, this was all gone. There wasn't any active vo volcano, volcanic activity here. All the lava was gone, it was dried up. And um, so you kind of wanted to be there when it was when it was going on that particular area. So what did I learn from it? Well, I'm, I came away from it with 10 basic lessons. By the way, if you want to get an idea of the scale here, this uh, trail right here was made by a bulldozer and you can get a car up it. These little dots are people. I'm one of these little dots, I think. So what did I get out of it? So here's some tips if you're going to head north. And this is mainly Iceland, but it also goes for Svalbard. Alaska or some other place, if you're going to head north, be prepared to pay. Um, in Thailand, you can get a really nice shrimp dinner for buck 50. In Iceland, try 45. Uh, the further north you get, the more expensive things get because everything has to be trucked in. If you're a vegetarian like I am, you're really going to pay because the vegetables, vegetables don't grow where it's freezing unless it's a greenhouse and that costs money. So the views are beautiful. The trip is totally worth it. But this is my vegetable burrito. This is 19 bucks. And I wasn't full after I ate this. I wanted another one. So it was like 38 bucks for lunch. Coffee is five bucks. The cups are small and um, there's usually no free refills. Now, those of you who've been around me before, you know that I'm extremely concerned about the appearance that I give off. And I'm, I mean, if, if it's not five star, I'm not interested. I'm super, super concerned about how I appear to other people. So I shop at Bonus, which is the cheapest place around. And later on, you're going to see the hotel I stayed at, which is an absolute dump. Anyway, second tip, be prepared to be cold. It's cold up there, maybe sunny, but it's cold. Here I am with five layers on. I've got my face liner, my wool cap, my sweatshirt cap, my jacket, and my, my windbreaker cap, and I'm still cold. Notice how these people are dressed. They're dressed for base camp Mount Everest, not for the beach in Southern California. I mean, these people, they basically are almost wearing survival suits a lot of the time, and it's cold. Here's my wife. A few shots back, you saw my wife at the Thai temple wearing just her usual shirt and pants. Here she's wearing about six layers and she was still cold. And we weren't close enough to the volcano for the volcano to be giving off any heat. Um, I always try to dress stylishly too. So sometimes I'll wear one of my mullets. Um, you can kind of look stylish as well as keep your head warm. Be physically fit before you come. Um, Iceland is not the place to show up and say, well, I'm going to show up here 10 pounds out of weight, overweight, and I'll, I'll, I'll get into shape hiking up there because it's not going to be good. So 
before I went to Iceland, I was, I was walking at least three miles a day, doing a lot of stairs, things like that, because sooner or later, it's kind of like having four wheel drive on your car. Desi and I were just out in the desert. We're commenting on the fact that you may not need four wheel drive when you go to the places that we go out in the desert more than once every two years, but when you need it, you need it. So you need to be physically fit before you show up here. Uh, this is the easy trail up route a, this is beginning of it. So this looks like, no, nah, no big deal. This is the end of the route a trail. This, this is, this is my wife coming down with her two, her two walking poles balancing carefully on her feet. And that's route a route a is the easy one. This is route B. Um, and you know, you, you start getting up here and you're looking up at the top and it's like, you know, you're just hoping it's not raining or anything like that, but be physically fit before you head there. And you might want to be able to run too. Like these dudes, I probably would not be wearing my backpack right next to the lava because if you notice there's lava above this guy's head, which means if the field breaks and the lava starts running down here, gravity is going to pull the lava very quickly here. So I probably would have left my pack further up the, uh, up the train. So all I had to do is just run up. Uh, the other thing about Iceland is uh, they, they're strong believers in Darwinism. Uh, I showed you that picture before of the lava running under the crack in the hardened lava coat. Okay, these guys are walking out to where the red hot lava stopped the day before. And they don't realize that red hot lava it usually moves underneath the lava in front of it when it reaches cooled lava. So they're walking out saying, well, gee, yeah, let's look at the cracks. See if we can see any red lava. You're probably walking over red lava. Probably not a good idea. And the Icelandic authorities, the log reglan, the police, they've already said, if you get in trouble near the volcano, you're on your own. We're not going in for you. So common sense is important. Pick your traveling partners. Uh, Desi and I were joking about this. Uh, uh, when Desi and I went to the desert, her husband is the ideal drone traveling partner because he totally understands that when she's there to fly, she's there to fly and she's going to fly. Um, I went to Iceland three times to see the volcano, twice by myself, once with my family. Uh, and my family is my wife and son are real troopers. We got up there and we hid behind a rock and it was snowing on us for about two hours. And then the, the snow broke. So we got out the drone, flew the drone. Then it started raining. So we hid under our ponchos for another two hours. And then we stopped raining. And I got my drone ready. It started snowing again. So we hid again for two hours. They put up with this for two days. And then, you know, we, we had kind of a family meeting and decided, you know, maybe we should do the rest of the ring road because this is getting a little old. Um, if you're going to enter a drone, my advice is either go by yourself so you can do exactly what you want or go with other droners because only other droners will understand why you're willing to sit out 10 hours in the freezing rain or the freezing snow just to fly your drone. Now, the second thing is I always try to be um, culturally sensitive when I go to other countries. So, um, you know, when I go to India, I don't wear leather shoes. When I go to Iceland, I avoid using my foot to point at things. And I always, I, I always kind of do the Thai salute to the monks. Uh, in Iceland, a lot of people believe in elves and they believe that if Iceland gives something to you, you should give something back. So I bring little treats for the elves. And this was my treat last time. This is Gollum from Lord of the Rings with the precious. So anyway, I took Gollum all three trips and I worked out a deal with Gollum where um, I was originally going to try to do as a stunt, fly the precious over the volcano and drop it in and watch it disintegrate. But Gollum talked me out of it. I said, okay, Gollum, you get me good, you get me good lava. I, I won't drop the ring into the volcano. So Gollum and I got along fine. Last trip, I said, okay, Gollum, you give me some really good flights here. And I'll leave you in Iceland with the precious for the elves. And he said, great. I love the elves. I'd rather stay in Iceland than sit on your desk in your stupid office anyway, which is where he'd been for six months. So anyway, um, this is my gift to the elves this time. This is Gollum in a little cave with the precious. And uh, it was a good deal. Gollum brought me excellent volcanoes. So I figured that I owed it to him. Camper van or hotel. Now, this is when I was in Svalbard, I had the opportunity to stay on this boat for three days, which is fantastic. But the boat doesn't get very close to the volcano. So you're stuck in either a camper van or staying in a hotel. And um, camper van... <clears throat> 
this was my uh, accommodations the last trip. Now, I uh, rather sarcastically refer referred to this guy as Mighty Thor because this van was far from mighty. Um, the engine was, uh, the engine had definitely seen better days. And then one of my friends corrected me and he said, this is actually a cartoon character called, oh, uh, what is his name? Um, He-Man. So then I said, okay, it's He-Man. It's not Mighty Thor. But I had this on the side of my car the entire trip. It was kind of embarrassing. And the worst thing was, this wasn't even the worst one in the lot. There's like this picture of some girl in a bikini. And I was like, oh God, I get that. They're going to think I'm some sort of pervert or something. And so anyway, I had to go around with Mighty Thor or whatever for the entire trip. And it was pretty bad. But um, as I drove around, it could have been worse. I could have gotten this one. I don't even know what this thing, it looks like some horrible monster. But anyways, I said before, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned about the image I project. So, um, you know, I, I, it's for me, it's like five star or nothing. Uh, this was our, our luxury suite uh, <laughs> during one of our trips, 180 bucks. Like I said, be prepared to pay in Iceland. And I'm sure that the, the, the unpainted wood was actually really stylistic. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, all sorts of celebrities stayed in this luxury suite before we did. Okay, number six, take two drones and be willing to lose one. And I can't emphasize that enough. If you're going to pay for the ticket, if you're going to pay for the car, if you're going to pay for the $19 burritos, take two drones, but also realize you may come back with one drone or no drones, but that's why you're there. So take the chance. Um, Iceland is beautiful. It's fantastic. But when you're flying over lava, lava is really hot. It's somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 degrees. I heard different opinions, but my drone just told me, I don't care. It's just too hot. Get me out of here. Um, this was some of the damage. <laughs> uh, I had no idea until I brought the thing back. I said, oh man, I guess I got a little too close to the, the heat that time. And then when my gimbal stopped functioning, that was sort of another, and I guess I got a little too close. But frankly, when you're flying in Iceland, your thumbs and your fingers are so, are so deadened from the cold, you can't feel anything anyway. So I wasn't even using my gimbal. I was just getting it near the volcano, trying to use my right thumb to sort of find the right control stick somehow. And I have to look at it, make sure I was there, then just start pulling back on it and hope for the best. Take extra batteries and extra memory cards, switch cards with each new battery. Uh, I take along at least 10 small memory cards. I switch them with every battery because wouldn't it be a bummer if you took like only one 256 and you flew for four days, you got all this beautiful footage and you put up with all the snow and all this horrible stuff. And then on your last flight and your last day, you ended up cratering into this thing and you lost everything. So swap out regularly. Extra batteries are a must. In the cold, they're not going to last long. So uh, be prepared 15 minutes average flight time if you want to give yourself enough time to bring it back and landed amongst the rocks in freezing cold weather. Be ready for wind. Iceland is a windy country. Uh, in the US, I always say, well, I don't want any wind. I don't want any snow. I want blue skies, certainly no rain. I want everything to be very pretty. In Iceland, I learned very quickly, you settle for no rain. If there's no rain, you just fly. It doesn't matter what else is there. You, and the beauty of Iceland is I tell everyone, they say, oh, Eric, that's such a pretty picture. I said, well, it's not me. It's, it's Iceland. You just take your drone, fly it up 100 feet, start hitting, take picture, and you'll get beautiful pictures. There's really no skill involved. You just, you just go to Iceland. Iceland does everything for you. This is, I don't know how well this is going to come across to you all. This is a video. This is a very good day for flight in Iceland. I don't know if you can see that on your screen, but the wind's blowing pretty well. All right. Now, if you happen to be somebody who is um, pays a lot of control to the warnings you get on your display, Iceland may not be a very comfortable place because when you get that strong wind, avoid flying, it's like, well, you're flying there every day. So you just ignore that one. But it tells you land immediately. That what that really means in Icelandic is land as soon as the battery is empty and then swap out another battery and fly again. If you follow those warnings, you're, you're never going to get in the air. So get ready for the warnings. Get ready to fly under conditions that you've never thought of flying in before. Number nine, be patient about the weather. The first trip over there, my Icelandic host told me, treat flying 
like the Icelanders do, which is if the weather's bad, don't even worry about it. Kick back in your car, have some coffee, wait 15 minutes or 10 minutes or an hour. Sooner or later, the weather's going to change. Maybe it's going to go from raining to snow. Maybe it's going to go from snow to nothing, though. You know, so just just wait it out. Last but not least, commit to taking the risk to get the picture. Again, all the common sense things that you've learned in the U.S. probably are worth reevaluating when you're in Iceland. For example, here, the weather below freezing, it had just stopped snowing. The wind was terrible. The light, I knew what my chances were of getting the drone back safely. But you know what? When am I going to be in Iceland again around the volcano? So you just go for it. Uh, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this well, but this is after the downward sensors were shot. The gimbal was shot. I had no idea where the drone was. It was night, but you know what? You just hang it out there. Somehow look down at your controls. Use the palm of your hand if you can't feel the controls because your thumbs are frozen. Just pull back on it. Hope for the best. I mean, that's that's Iceland for you. And um, you know, I I have I have no regrets about the chances I took or the damage I did to my drones taking it because especially now, unfortunately, the volcano looks like it's gone into hibernation. Um, you know, all I have are the pictures and the memories. And I'm sure glad that I have them because uh, I'd be very upset if if I hadn't done it. So anyway, this is. Uh, I did bring the drone back safely this time. Um, I had to dance around a bunch of lava rocks and I got my glove on, I managed to hand grab it. And then I sat down the lava rock and cut myself. But anyway, that goes with the territory. So whatever, it was worth it. So this is on the positive side. On the negative side, when I was there, especially my last trip, there were a whole lot of people, Desi, and Kim, you two would have freaked out here because there are a whole lot of people who had just bought drones and they took them up to the launch site and they were unboxing them and trying to learn how to fly under these conditions. And it was, um, it, it was uh, frankly, kind of a nightmare to be around that. Uh, this is, for example, um, I, I pulled my drone down because there are too many nutcases who had just gotten their, their Mavic minis out and some of them even put the prop guards on. One guy, I, I went over to him and I said, um, yeah, I wouldn't put the prop guards on because that thing's not going to make it back. And, um, and, and he said, who are you? And I said, well, I, are you the police? I said, well, no, I, I'm nobody. Don't worry about me. So I just went over and watched him, put the prop guards on. Last thing I saw, his drone was taken off downwind. He never got it back. So he came all the way over here, got his Mavic Mini up in the air. It's way off in the lava flows somewhere. But um, this guy, let's see, he'll, he'll come up pretty soon. Um, I, I was kind of really getting ticked off at this guy. He flew his drone about 10 feet over my head. And I was like, okay, so you came all the way to Iceland. Uh, here, was, here he is. Yeah, okay. So why don't you just get a 10-foot a bamboo pole, put your cell phone on the end, hold it up above your head. <laughs> You'll get the same picture. So, I mean, if you're going to come all the way, you might as well commit to um, taking some risks and getting the pictures that you want. So anyway, happy travels. Thank you for watching. I appreciate it. And um, I see there's a bunch of chat. Desi, I'll let you take it over from here. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Stunning. Just <laughs> stunning. Um, I think uh, Vic said it We right. all hate you We're just a little jealous. bit. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, sorry. Man. I did like you at one time, Eric, but now I don't know. Man. Oh, God. Oh. <sighs> Oh. My trip to Finland got canceled, so I can do anything cool like you did. Uh, <laughs> well, whatever. Join the club, Farns. I, I've got, I've got a trip to Mongolia and a trip to Finland and Sweden that are still waiting on on COVID restrictions being lifted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a couple I'm waiting on too. So, and, and I'm I'm a but little worried you went about to Iceland. I'm a little worried about the Mongolian. I'm afraid they're going to be out of business by the time I go there. So I don't know. Right. Right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, thank that was, you. That was just an incredible story. Eric, you're like, for me personally, like when I hear your story, your pictures are, you know, they are the, um, the outcome of your tenacity, your determination, your vision, your creativity. You know, you don't just go to Iceland and take pictures. I mean, just the whole process of 
you know, being visualizing your goal and then just being so darn determined. I mean, that's a lesson that each and every one of us can learn from right there. I mean, just your preparation, you know, really, I mean, I hats off to you, brother. I mean, I really, the admiration that I have for you, I just, who knew you were this amazing, determined, gold-gagging, get-shit-done kind of person? Love it. Well, just don't let your drones talk to my drones or my drones are going to tell your drones to tell you not, not, not to go because they're, they're going to re- turn me into the FAA for drone abuse, I think. <laughs> That's okay. Do they sell feel like- drones in, do they sell drones in Iceland? They do. I, I haven't even checked the prices. That's one reason why I took two drones every trip. Yeah. The, um, they're probably ridiculously high, like the $19 vegetable burrito. Right, exactly. Exactly. I feel like I just watched a, a, a Nat Geo documentary. That was <laughs> Absolutely. amazing, bro. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, wow. oh, thank you. I, I appreciate yeah, that. Definitely. I, so, I mean, Jesse, do you want to go through all the questions? I do or? have a couple of questions that I, I saw popping up. There's so many comments of, yeah. wow, amazing, stunning, unbelievable, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think everybody is just floored with oh, geez. the yeah. f- footage that you have. A uh, couple of questions that have popped up are, uh, what drone are you flying? A, a very badly damaged set of Mavic 2s. <laughs> Yeah, I just I just fly the Mavic 2 and I fly the smart controller. That's that's all I use. All right. And then uh, Carolyn had asked about what months do you recommend traveling or visiting there? Um, if you can go in the if you go in the spring, it's daylight 24 seven. So what I do when I'm when I'm going in, in spring or summer by myself is I stay up for 48 hours in a row and I just work at my office and then I sleep on the plane. And then by the time I get to Iceland, I'm just ready to go. I hit that. I hit that. And I basically don't stop. I'll sleep maybe three hours a night. Um, sometimes I'll sleep out on location. And then by the time I'm at the end of the trip, I just sleep on the way home. When I come back to the office, I sleep in the office. Uh, so winter is Once great. Again. Once again, Once again, I bow no, to the guru. I bow no, to the no, guru. No, no, no. Come on. Let's take a field trip, man. Set one up. I'm willing to go. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd be more than happy to lead a a tour of Iceland. Unfortunately, with the volcano being dormant, it's like, I I mean, I honestly feel like I lost an old friend. You know, you ever had a friend where like your friends and you, you write them once in a while and you call them once in a while, but you kind of say, oh, old Johnny's always going to be there. And then one day you find out old Johnny died and you have all these regrets. Like I never called him. I didn't write him enough. I never went to see him. Right. And it's like, I feel like old Johnny is the volcano. So yeah, I'm more than happy to lead a tour of Iceland. I, I love Iceland. Um, oh, we're going to hold just, you to that one. I mean, I, I, I totally <laughs> feel at home there. And I, I've been basically a misfit in everything I've ever done in life up to this point. But in Iceland, I feel at home. So I'm, I'm glad to go back to Iceland anytime. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's beautiful. So um, popping back over to our chat, Eric, can you put your information in there if anybody wanted to reach out? Because I've got one in here that Crystal is actually planning on doing um, some touring for volcanoes and such. And um, I'm sure she found it very, very helpful in information that you were providing. Oh, yeah. I'd be more than happy to do another Zoom for anyone who's interested in anything on Iceland where you can just ask me questions or stuff like that, more than happy to do that. Awesome. Or if you're, I thought your your Thailand stuff was amazing too. I mean, that was so cool. The colors, you know, Uh, like to be able to see the before and afters. I mean, we've seen those pictures in like DJI books and stuff like that. And I mean, those were, which picture, that's why, which picture won you your, and what'd you win from DJI? Well, it was a video I did for DJI and I won a drone and a carrying case and a bunch of other little stuff. It was very cool. Fun. Yeah, All right. so it, was, it was, it was, it was, it was fun. I mean, it just probably would have been, winner. it was yep. probably would have been yep. better if I had like actually looked at the results and said I had to call DJI. And I mean, seriously, I, I felt so incredibly stupid talking to them on the phone and they're, 
they're like, you know, well, didn't you look at the results? Well, no, I didn't. Um, you know, <laughs> no wonder they didn't go to me for their patent advice. They probably said, Eric Hansen guy is the stupidest patent attorney ever created. Don't, don't, don't oh, have him do it. your patents. <laughs> <Stop it. laughs> so Eric, I, I'm yeah. curious, you had mentioned that, you know, the evenings were the best time of day to be yeah. in there. Of course, my mind went to, oh, what are all the rules and regulations? But um, what about, okay, we won't go down that rabbit hole just yet. But, <laughs> Don't ask um, you about whether I, 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 I kept to the line of sight. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I've got really good eyes. I can see at least a mile and a half away. You have good eyes. Okay. I do. I do. At Very dark. good eyes. You can see a mile and a half at dark. In dark. In darkness. Not a problem. <laughs> That's because you were in a He-Man band. You had the power. Really? I got the power from He-Man and I had the power from That's Gollum. Right. Gollum was with me all the time. I That's owed all right. to Gollum. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so, but what kind of camera settings did you use? <laughs> Auto? <laughs> Auto. I don't Auto, know. Okay. Yeah. I, just, I, just, I just go fly. I don't have anybody. I, I mean, the, the people flying around me, they didn't know not to put on the prop guards on a Mavic Mini when, when it's blowing 30 knots. Um, there's no one there to help me out. So I, I'd love to go to some people and know more than I do. That'd be actually really helpful. Hey, you pay my way. I'll teach you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm desperate. I'll just go. <laughs> go through your bags. <laughs> right? Up route B. Desi, you might have a, you might have a deal there, but man, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to see you in, in, you know, with, with, uh, Com completely dislocated shoulders and knees from walking up uh, Route B with two bags. Yeah, I could see me. And actually the cold kind of concerns me. <laughs> you know, being sunny Southern California for the most part. Mm, yeah. Well, it's it's <laughs> brutal. <laughs> and it's not like so Minneapolis was it like cold. minus 15 or what was it? Was it like minus 15? Like what was I, it? Because I, I get a, in the cold weather here. On a good day, it was three or four Celsius. Oh, okay. That's yeah. cold. But the thing is that it's it's different. I mean, if you're in Minneapolis in the winter, and I've I've spoken at a convention there. Okay, it's brutally cold. It's probably colder than it is in Iceland. But when it gets cold, you either hop into a Starbucks or you hop into a cab or you go back to your hotel room. When you're four miles up this horrendous dirt trail in Iceland, you're in no rescue zone. I mean, especially when you hike to get away from all the people. No one's going to see if something happens to you. So <laughs> you've got to you've got to come prepared. And there comes a there comes a time when my body was just telling me, I think I better leave now because I don't know if I'm going to get down this mountain if I stay here any longer. Right. I mean, right. Yeah. Yep. But any problem with sense, you any know? problem with security at the airport? None whatsoever. As far as the drones, were they carry no. on or were they put in your luggage? Uh, the drones are always in my hard shell and the batteries are always in my carry on. No questions whatsoever. They're so used to drones. Uh, they, they, they didn't even open my bag. And on the few occasions they've opened my bag, they'll look at this. And I'll say, I'll wave my hand. I'll say drone flyer here. They go, okay, whatever. Go ahead. <laughs> Not a problem. Iceland is so used to drones. They should probably have a you know, they've got the TSA set special lane. They should probably have just a lane for drone flyers. Wow. So do they have any regulations as far as uh, remote pilot certificates or anything like that? <laughs> well, it changes all the time. Oh. If you look, if you look at my drone, I actually registered my drone in Iceland. Then by the time I went, you didn't have to register it. The uh, national parks, they banned drones in the national parks, fortunately, after I flew over Thingveller. Um and the regulation seems to seem to change all the time. At this point, it's it's fairly similar to the United States. But for example, when I was flying that 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 footage I showed of that that guy who's flying ten feet over my head, there's a helicopter two hundred feet over my head at another time, and so it's the wild west there. You got helicopters. They came low over the places where people are flying their drones because they wanted to show the side of their helicopter that had their advertising in there. So you might look at the side of the helicopter and say, oh, I think I'm going to go on, on, on the Thor tour. Yeah, Thor, hey, Thor, can you get a little bit lower? Let me take a picture of that so I can go on your helicopter tour. And then other people are doing it. So you had helicopters coming. I swear they're 150 feet off the, off the deck. And they were landing on the very hill that I was flying beyond to get a perspective view. So it's, it's totally the Wild West there. All the rules and regulations are out the door. Wow. 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 Yeah. So um, there's so many comments being popped up into the uh, chat. Uh, I think a lot of people are really on board with the women and drones having uh, some sort of a vacation in that area and <laughs> heading that way, right? Planning it, right? <laughs> I, 
That would be just give me an excuse to get back to Iceland and I'm there. <laughs> I'll make sure I get yeah. a really warm jacket. We could also have everyone at Thai West once uh, COVID is over and we can actually get back out to the island. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. And so we did have a couple other questions. There was one actually in there that was about wearing the, and I'm, I'm trying to scroll up really quick to find it, about um, covering your, your drums and putting them in the um, battery cases. And I, I'm sorry. Battery I, wet, wet suits. Yeah, I think I saw that. Uh, if anybody wanted to kind of chime in on that one. Um, do you do anything special when you're traveling and can we, we have about six minutes left and we're at the top of the hour. Uh, so, um, do you do anything specific when you're traveling and then just traveling with drones in general? The first, the first, the first trip I didn't, and the drones ended up in my, my pants pockets to try to keep them warm. Um, the second and third trip, I bought those little hand warmers and I fired up the hand warmers, put the hand warmers in my pocket put another one in the drone case that helped a little bit i maybe got two to three minutes more out of the battery life um but it was not appreciable i i travel with a, a, a gps backpack case and i just cram it full and i just travel with that all right I do a lot i do a lot of cold weather flying obviously um and i i do similar things i've got the uh, hand warmers and but I use I use them on the inside pockets. I have, I have a couple of nice jackets, um, and I put the drone and or not the drone, the battery drone doesn't fit the battery <laughs> and the um, and the uh, pocket or the hand warmers in the inside pockets, and they work great. Oh, they work great. Nice. And as far as those wetsuits, I strongly advise against them if you're putting your battery on them because of the heat sink. Oh. Plus, you really shouldn't be flying in the rain anyway, unless you're nice in your air. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great tips there. Thank you. All right, and then love the tip about uh, switching out your your SD card because that makes so much sense. And and I know Vic had also mentioned that he just does it all the time. That's a good practice, and that way you know you're saving your data uh, between. There you go. What you got there, Eric? Share this it. this is this is the one that I take, and so I swap these out with every battery. And if I put them in facing me, that means that they're they're fresh. And if they're not facing me, it means I've already flown that day with them. So that's make sure that if if I place. if I lose my pictures, I only lose one battery's worth of pictures. Yeah, you would not want to lose the whole batch. That would not be good. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Looks like Founds has to leave. So, all right, Founds, we're really glad you could join us. Hey, Eric, thank you so much. That was awesome. Oh, no, oh, no problem. Um, hand warmers. I use the Zippo hand warmers. And oh, really? those things are amazing. And they okay. last all day long. So, and it's better for the environment. Okay. Good deal. All thank right. you. Take care, guys. Bye bye. 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 All right. So, we are running. Uh, right up at the top of the hour right now. Um, do you have any one last tip or recommendation or anything as far as traveling and heading out to the various areas? Yeah, pick some place on the map that you've never been, get on Dronestagram to see what's there and just go for it. It's right. actually Dronestagram. Dronestagram, yes. yes. He's never actually been a winner too. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Instagram. Well, and one thing I want to say that, uh, you know, that Eric has showed all of us is just, you know, whether you're in California, Philadelphia, where, get your drone out and fly it and start snapping some pictures. Like, you know, Eric, you know, w when he went to Thailand, he just took his drone up and started taking pictures. And that's, that's great. But that's how people started noticing him, right? So if you have a drone, get out and just start taking pictures. Go out and start taking pictures. Number one, it's great practice. Number two, it'll, like Eric has, his vision got broader and broader. Right, Eric? Become more creative. So, I mean, that's the one big takeaway I have is, you know, get out and fly your drone, you know, yeah. because the things that Eric did to fly his drone, that takes a lot of muscle to build, you know, to have that tenacity. Right, Eric? Well, it, it, 
it just it kind of comes from within when you really like something right and um so that's that's i think why people who don't fly drones sometimes don't understand people who do fly drones very well right they don't really get it and they don't understand why it's worth waiting and going through all this just to get pretty pictures and see things that higher perspective yes Right, absolutely. And then just the power of getting out and flying by yourself, like a lot of times, I mean, I know where, where I live in Philadelphia, a lot of times people like don't fly a lot, you know, when it's cold out and we're out flying in the cold weather. And it's like, you know, we can go out and fly by ourselves, you know, go out and do a battery, especially because we have a lot of people on this call that are just learning how to fly. So, you know, definitely get out and fly your drone, like go take some local pictures. And once again, you'll start getting an eye for things. You know, and you'll start finding your niche, you know, so, so many different niches and views because we all have a different view. You know, even though we're seeing it from the area, we all see something a little different, right? So I love it. Love it. Awesome. Well, Eric, we thank you so much for sharing your story, sharing your photos and your videos. It's incredible. Yay. Thank you. Oh, very, very inspirational. And a lot uh, of people are- The anticipation was building. It was so exciting. It's great. It's better than what we expected. And, and good for you. Kudos to you for uh, getting all those awards in Thailand. And, and just, re it's just, that's really awesome. You know, it's, it just lets people know how powerful of a of a tool we have in our hands. Yes. When I, I, when I was when I was preparing for this, I I was I just thought, okay, this is probably nothing. I, I, every quarter, at the end of the quarter, I do a, a I use QuickBooks to you know rank rank clients in terms of how much they gave our firm, what type of work we did for them to get that money, and then I I thought just casually, you know, I, I'm just going to put a check next to everybody that I either directly or indirectly got through droning. It's over 50% of my income. That's like, wow. this, is a, this is a huge thing wow. for me. I didn't realize it, wow. but it's, yeah, it's like, That's this awesome. is a huge thing. It's like, <laughs> if, I, if I didn't drone, I'd be taking like a 50%, over 50% pay cut from what I make right <laughs> now. It's like, wow, okay. Else. Here's yeah. something. You'll find something else. Yeah. And you're just out there yeah. having fun. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. right. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Eric. That was incredible. Yay, no, no problem. Eric. Thank you for attending. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today because we love when you come and join us and we get this networking time in. And we're looking forward to seeing you next week. And thank you again, Eric, for sharing with us. Thanks, Eric. My pleasure. Right, have a factor. wonderful week, everybody. <laughs> awesome stuff, Eric. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Have a great right. day, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks for Bye. attending, folks. Bye. That kind of wraps it up.